In 1989, Madonna was named Artist of the Decade by many newspaper and magazine polls. Ooh, Michael ain't gonna like that shit. In July 1987, Michael Jackson's Bad was released to the public. The problem with Bad, critics argued, was that unlike Off the Wall and Thriller, it offered few truly memorable songs. Ooh, ah, yikes. Michael wrote most of Bad himself, perhaps propelled by his newfound interest in music publishing and the millions in songwriting royalties he garnered from songs he wrote from the last two albums. Rod Temperton, whose talents helped make Off the Wall and Thriller such outstanding albums, was not represented. The album's most intriguing moment is the reflective Man in the Mirror, written not by Michael, but by Saida Garrett. Michael's and first single from Bad, I Just Can't Stop Loving You, was released worldwide on July 27, 1987, and went straight to number one in America and to the same position in the UK after just two weeks. Then Michael's Bad album debuted at number one, on the Billboard charts, an amazing feat proving that even when Michael does wrong, he can do no wrong. The second single, Bad, also went to number one in America, Britain, and countries around the world. Michael had a hit on his hands with the Bad album, but certainly nothing as big as Thriller. In September 1987, the month his Bad tour kicked off in Tokyo, people published a cover story on Michael with the headline, Michael Jackson, he's black, he's bad. Is this guy weird or what? Of course, Michael had good reason to be unhappy with the story. They made me sound like a freak, he said. None of that stuff is true. Oh, yes, it is. When he when bought the Beatles catalog, you trolling, because there's no reason for you to have it. Like the only thing that I could think of is when his father had said to him while he was still with the brothers that he believed that his boys could be as big as the Beatles. And that's something that he kept within him for years. So I know since my, since my father thinks that the Beatles are super big, I'm going to show him who's bigger and buy their catalog. OK, I didn't talk about that because, like I said, when it comes to trolling, uh, now that I see what it is, it's kind of irritating. Right. Um, also, the elephant man bones the, and then the hyper hyperbolic chambers. You know what I'm saying? Like um, I recall Michael holding one of his babies over the balcony. Now, that was way too far just way too far. What are you doing? But to me, that incident was trolling gone wrong. Oh, you're going to fake like you're going to drop the baby. Come on. You're not about to drop that baby. How old is Blanket now? Blanket's like what? 37, 40. I don't know how old Michael Jackson's kids is, but that's just him being him, you know? Now, don't get me wrong. I do think that motherfucker's weird. Okay. And he did a lot of weird shit. But what Virgo ain't. In January 1988, Michael was well on his way to his 30th birthday. Despite his best-selling records, his celebrity, and his great fortune, he had recently begun to lament that he felt undervalued, not only by the music industry, but by the public as well. They call Elvis the king, he complained to Frank Dillio. Why don't they call me that? 
what year is this? When did they start calling Michael Jackson the king of pop? And then, and then this is another thing, because you know Virgos are extremely petty, because he feels that he should be on the level as Elvis Presley. Now he's smitten with Elvis Presley's daughter, okay? Because I can't be the king, I'm going to fuck the king's daughter. And this is like crazy to me, because I'm like, Michael Jackson, you've been the prince of pop forever. Oh, wait a minute, was it the prince of pop or the king of pop? What is Michael Jackson? Or is it Usher? That's the Prince of Pop. Who is it? The King of Pop is Michael Jackson. And Usher is the Prince of Pop, right? One would think that given all he had achieved, Michael would have been satisfied. He wasn't. Indeed, ever since he was a child, he had been taught that being number one was the most important thing he could do with his life. Because it was a goal he had worked towards for years, reaching it before his 30th birthday seemed anticlimactic. After all, what was left for a recording artist to do after selling more records than any person ever in the history of popular music. In 1989, Madonna was named Artist of the Decade by many newspaper and magazine polls. Ooh. Michael ain't gonna like that shit. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Warner Brothers, her record label, even paid for an advertisement in one of the industry trade publications, pronouncing Madonna Artist of the Decade. It was the kind of empty compliment record labels often give their artists in paid promotion, but Michael was incensed by it just the same. He telephoned John Bronca and Frank Dillio and complained that Madonna didn't deserve such an award. It makes me look bad. I'm the artist of the decade, aren't I? Did she outsell Thriller? Michael asked, his vast insecurity coming forth. No, she did not, he said. John, who lately was in the business of problem solving for Michael, suggested that he could approach MTV with the idea of a fictional award. Off the top of his head, John came up with something he called the Video Vanguard Artist of the Decade Award. Wow. Wow. Michael is such a wham wham. But you know what them Virgos, that crying and complaining and fussing and kicking and hollering shit works for them. That title sure sounded impressive to Michael. He was happy. Again, that'll teach the heifer, he said, speaking of Madonna. And so it came to pass that at the MTV Awards in 1989, Michael was presented with the Video Vanguard Artist of the decade trophy. Hold please. Do y'all remember when MTV didn't even let niggas on the platform and now they making up awards for one of the the biggest niggas? You can have a bumper car bumping. Peter Gabriel handed over the honor, certainly not the most meaningless award ever offered at such a festivity, but sad in that it was given to a fella who really wanted people to know he deserved it. To this day, the Michael Jackson Video Vanguard Award is presented to artists who excel in that medium. A testament not so much to Michael's amazing videos, but to John Bronco's amazing ability to placate his client. Ooh, come on, come on, terrible Lele. Your fangs are showing. On February 23rd, 1988, Michael Jackson bought the bad tour to the United States for the first time at the Kemper Arena in Kansas City, Missouri. By this time, the three single releases from Bad, I Just Can't Stop Loving You, Bad, and The Way You Make Me Feel had all gone to number one. Michael was in good spirits, especially since Frank Dillio predicted that there would probably be two more number one hits. A good third of the show consisted of material Michael and his brothers had used in Kansas City four years earlier when the Victory Tour opened right down 
to some of the dialogue. This time, though, Michael performed Thriller in his act complete with werewolf mask and the kind of high school jacket he wore in the video. When Catherine and Joseph saw the show, they were disturbed by it. He should have the brothers with him, Joseph said, not letting go of the idea. What the hell's the point in not having them? I don't get it. He's got a good show, but with his brothers, it's a better show, Catherine told Frank. She thought Michael was better when he performed with his brothers. I mean, visually, I'm sure it's better. But emotionally for Michael, no, he, he no, pressure breaks the pike left in her face. Wait a minute, Frank. Hold on, girl. Hold on, girl. Don't laugh in my mama's face. I don't give a fuck how ridiculous her statement is. You got me. You are crazy, he told her. See, that's the bush I'm talking about. Imagine telling Michael's mother that she was crazy. Of course, she was offended. I'm not crazy, she shot back. The show would have been better with the brothers, and that's that. Yeah, well, Frank said before walking off, just prior to going on stage in Kansas City, Michael was handed a copy of The Star, a tabloid with the cover headline, Michael Jackson Goes Ape. Now he's talking with his pet chimp in monkey language. The story claimed that Michael was now obsessed with learning how to communicate with his pet monkey by making chimp sounds. Did Frank plant this? Michael wanted to know. Where'd they get these pictures of me and Bubbles? Michael's aide shrugged his shoulders. Well, I don't like it, Michael said. I don't want to see this. Don't show me this kind of stuff before I go on stage. What's the hell wrong with you? I mean, yeah, you don't want... Come on, he about to go on stage. Like many stories published about Michael, the tale of his fixation with Bubbles, a three-and-a-half-year chimp who had been released to Michael from a cancer lab in 1985, was false. In March 1988, while he was still on the road, Michael Jackson finalized the purchase of his new home, a 2,700-acre estate. Oh, you say that you love me. 